Hey, I'm Ron Drotos from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to day 28 of my 31 day Jazz Piano for Beginners Workshop Challenge. And today is the kind of jazz piano lesson I used to always love to have. I try to make all these like this, but um, this one sort of in particular because it's, it's the kind of lesson that will uh, help you apply the theory. You know, I used to just ask my teachers so many questions. It probably drove them crazy. So it wasn't just about the chords and techniques, although that's important, of course, but it's about the overall context of jazz because that's especially nowadays when there's less jazz in clubs than ever and less of a musical scene that you can just go and hang out. Um, it, it's more important than ever to get this bigger picture, both in terms of the history, what's done before, what are the certain, like each player has their own vibe, you know, that kind of a thing, you know, or somebody's more bluesy, somebody's more beboppy, someone's a little more emotional, someone's a little more technical, you know, to really know those so that you can make informed choices about your own playing and develop those um, natural tendencies in yourself, the ones you want to, uh, to develop, but also um, to get a sense of how to proceed, you know, because it's like we're just sort of, you know, flailing in the dark a lot, you know, so, but there's tried and true ways. So that's what we're going to do today, because basically, let me set this for 20 minutes. So um, it's one thing to um, learn jazz standards, and that's absolutely where we've been going, because everything we've been doing will help you learn tunes in the real book, um, Autumn Leaves, you know, we've done so what, you know, because you'll see these two five ones, these one six two five ones in them, you'll see the jazz blues. So you're already well on your way. So you should definitely start just even plunking out melodies to internalize the tunes over time because um, I still play tunes that I've played when I was 15 years old and they get deeper and deeper into, um, into to me, you know, and I can express myself through them better and better. Keith Jarrett has spoken about that too, playing tunes you've known for a long time. Um, on the other hand, how do you get started at jam sessions? And that's what we got to get you going, right? Because it's about using it. It's one thing to learn Spanish in a book and taking tests and everything, but to actually having conversations with people, even in a simple way, especially in a simple way, is really going to get us fluent, right? So that's what we're going to do with music. So the hardest thing to do is to say, okay, I know my chords, I know some scales, I've played a little bit of jazz, I'm going to go down to the local club where they have a Thursday night jam session with professional or very experienced rhythm section, the drummer, bass player, and I'm going to sit in when it's my turn and I'm going to play the tune I've been working on for six months, say Autumn Leaves, right? That, you can do that and um, it can work. It can be pretty terrifying. I remember I used to get really nervous doing that. I only did it, I only did it like twice, I think, because I was already playing every day with my friends and then sometimes gigging, uh, even at you know my teenage years. But um, uh, that can be terrifying. And also, it's sort of like it puts the pressure on because you only have one tune in the whole night, and you gotta you know you feel like you have to impress everybody, and uh, it, it 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 can backfire, or at least it it's not always pleasant, right? Now, if that's the only thing you have available to you, you don't know anybody else who plays jazz, and you know that they have a, a jam session every week at this club, I would suggest that you go down there the first time, order something to eat or whatever, and uh, do not sit in. Just take it in. Take in the scene. Meet some other people who are sitting in. Get some confidence. Get to know. Get become comfortable and get to know the musicians a little bit. Okay, I remember once in Hartford, Connecticut, I used to sit in a place, and um, it seemed like the uh, the pianist was really nice, but the drummer and there was a vibraphonist had a real edge to them. So I went down a few times, and I just got sort of used to how they dealt with people and everything. And then I, I spoke to the pianist, you know. <laughs> Can I sit in? So uh, and he was nice, you know. Um, uh, you could even go two or three times without playing at first, you know, that could be a good way to acclimate, is that the word, acclimate, acclimatize yourself to the climate, you know, get used to the climate, get used to the environment, become comfortable there, like it's a second home almost. So the best way though, to improvise, to jam session, to improvise with other people, jam, is to find someone at your level. 
So if you only know one chord, D minor 7, well, you know more than that because you've been playing for this for 27 days, 28 days. But you could just take the chords we know and find a guitarist or a bass player or a drummer who's just getting to know the jazz beat. Or can, maybe they can only play funk, so you do these over a funk beat, you know? Or um, uh, a saxophonist or a trumpet player or a flute or somebody who is... Um, uh, at the same level you are, approximately. And you can just sort of learn together. That's what I did. I started out in a rock band in high school and we played a little jazzy stuff. So for instance, instead of starting with a jazz standard like Autumn Leaves and kind of barely getting through it, why don't we say, all right, you know what? We're, and we're gonna do this right now. We're gonna start on, um, we'll start on C major seven. And we're just gonna play that chord, kind of treat it modally. Play up and down the scale and have some fun with a swing beat and we're going to treat it like a tune in a sense so um uh, let's see i will start by taking a solo so you can imp you can comp you can do the same voicing in both hands or you could just do one right c major seven c e g b i'm going to walk a bass line and you're going to comp and i'll take a solo and then when i'm done with my solo i'm not even going to count the measures when i'm done with my solo i'll sort of finish the solo nod to you and then you come in and you take a solo and I'll come to you. You can play chord, the chord in the left hand and comp with your right hand, or just play the right hand. I saw a video of Herbie Hancock and Antonio Carlos Jobim play, uh, Jobim's tune Wave. Must have been in the 80s. And Herbie didn't even play left hand because Jobim was here at the piano playing both hands. And Herbie just soloed with his right hand. So if Herbie can do it, we can do it. And that's one of my sayings now. If anybody says, oh, you didn't play with your left hand, say, oh, it's something I heard Herbie do. I'm not going to argue with that. So, um, and then after you solo, actually, I won't know when you're done, so I will just sort of wait an appropriate time and say, okay, fours. And then we're going to trade four measures. I'll go one, two, with your left hand all time. And then we'll just come to an ending. So we're treating it like the solos in a real tune, okay? Because this could be a real tune. You have one chord tunes, all right? Here we go. Uh, C major seven. I'll start the solo first. One, two. A one, two, three, four.
uh, prepare a little ahead of time and write like a 16 bar tune in the key of C. And you use that as the melody, the head, the beginning and the end. You know, it could be... That could be your melody, you know, and you write it out. If it's for a tenor sax or trumpet, you transpose it to appropriately, or alto sax. And you play that at the beginning, and then you take your solo, they take their solo, then you trade fours or eights. I, I read something very interesting about trading uh, fours and eights recently, because I don't think I've heard it in the swing era, the 30s. I think the first time I remember hearing it was, you know, in the recordings from the uh, mid to late 1940s with the Beboppers, Charlie Parker's group. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, uh, apparently one of Miles Davis's uh, band members in the 80s when he was playing all the funk stuff asked him about that you know when did you guys start uh you know why did you start trading for us and he said it was to keep charlie parker awake on the bandstand because he'd always fall asleep and if he had a trade for us it'd be oh i gotta stay awake for that so who knows who knows all right uh it's plausible okay so that's a great way to jam, right? And it's fun, and it's low pressure, and you develop your skills that will help you when you're playing the jazz standards. So now, let's, uh, let's do the same thing on another chord. And, and if you notice, this is how we began this month, these 31 days, just doing things like this, because it's the very beginning, but it's also something that now has more meaning, because you can play it better. Right? And also you realize that it's a great way to just start at first. It's like maybe, oh, we're just playing one chord. And now it's like, oh, I get to play one chord and be creative and use my ear. This is why Miles Davis in the fifth, late 50s went back to playing modally or started playing modally because uh, he felt that playing all those hard chord changes to him was becoming the same all the time. Like, oh, I got to play this, I got to play that, I got to navigate this. And a lot of the playing got stale for a lot of players after a while. Um, and this is a way for him to freshen up his playing. Miles didn't mind playing on one chord for a while, so you know we can really embrace that. So let's do D minor seventh. Now, uh, probably the simplest way, and idiomatic in jazz, would be to sort of pretend it's a two chord, even though it's kind of a one because it's the only chord we're using. So if this was the two in the key of C, D minor seventh, D F A C we would uh, play the C major scale over it, right? That's what we've been doing, white notes. But D is now the tonic, D is home plate. So it's really from D to D, it's also called the Dorian mode. Um, but we're not gonna get overly theory right now. All you have to know is that it's called the Dorian mode, it's all white notes, and it's the same as a major scale, a step lower. If you know them, uh, well, I won't even get there, okay? That's all we have to know because we're learning by doing, and then, understanding it theoretically a little later on. So let's, um, let's start here, okay? Same routine. Matter of fact, I'm gonna play a melody that I have composed, I haven't, but I'll make one up, and then I'll say solo. I'm gonna solo, then you solo, D minor seventh, and then we trade eights. Let's trade eight measures each this time, okay? One, two, a D minor seven and.
hey, go with it, right? That's fun. Make up another one kind of similar. But you could write one out, like I said. Yeah, so that's another, it's a great way. It's also a great way to learn different modes and scales and chords with other people, you know, for support. Hey, here's a new uh, uh, mode I'm learning or a new scale. Let's, let's play it together for 20 minutes, you know, and support each other. That's how everybody did it, you know, Thelonious Monk, um, teenager, you know, they used to jam together. Sonny Rollins used to show up at Monk's house. Miles Davis used to go to Thelonious Monk's door and knock on the door and say, is Monk awake yet? You know, I have some questions to ask him about music. And sometimes I think, from what I've read, Miles had to wait even an hour or two, and he would do that. He would wait right there until Monk woke up and, and could help him. So this is a great way to start jamming. If you want, you can play along with a rhythm track, you know, play along with a drum track, you know, or um, iReal Pro, get iReal Pro or Band in the Box or something. And it can even be a bass line and a, uh, a drum beat if you're playing with another non-rhythm section instrument. You can get together with another pianist. One can play the chords, one can jam. You know, our solo. Right? So let's pretend we were learning B flat major seven, okay? So you want to work on B flat major seven. Because we're going to get to two five one and B flat. So we have a B flat major seven, which is a major triad. B flat, you can play with me, D, F. And then the major seventh is a whole step below the octave here, so A. So B flat major seventh is B flat, D, F, A. And the B flat major scale, I'll put this down below in the notes, but it's B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, A, B flat. It's Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, T, Do, or C, Do, however you put it. <laughs> so remember, you can just play that one note, the B flat, for a while. Let's just jam a little on B flat major seven. B flat, D, F, A. And start with just the one note, B flat. A one, two, you know what to do. Oh boy. You know what, we'll come back to that tomorrow because I had so much planned today. But you get going, and that's the same thing when you're jamming with people, you know? So um, this ties into what I was talking about yesterday. We've developed a really good uh, habit of just showing up and doing it, and I'm feeling it too. So, you know, for me, it's definitely getting me in the groove every day. So what are you gonna do after the 31 days? That's the main thing. Don't let this become an ending. Make it a beginning, which is really what it should be, jazz pianos piano for beginners, not jazz piano for enders, right? So um, you could uh, find somebody to jam with and just say, hey, every uh, week, every Thursday after work or in the morning or whatever, let's get together and play for two hours, you know? Play for an hour, have a little break, play for another 50 minutes or something. Or you could find a local teacher. If there's somebody that you know that's got a positive attitude that isn't gonna be too front-loaded with theory and make it too dry, Absolutely, that's great. Go to a local teacher, support them, uh, get the most out of it that you can, and it will give you that continuity that you need for you know however long it takes, right? I've gone through periods in my life where I was studying steadily with people every week, day in, or week in, week out, whether I practiced or not, and that got me there, it connected the musical thread. I've gone through periods in my life where I just took lessons every once in a while with somebody, or times when I worked on my own. So I think we all need all those times, but there's definitely a time when it will help you, just like with this month, to be connected with somebody. So if there's somebody local, absolutely do it. If you'd like to stay with me, I would love to help you. So I have a video course you could take, and it's low cost, and I made it that way on purpose. It has hundreds of videos, I don't know, almost 400 videos, many of them jazz, probably 200 jazz. A lot of the play-along stuff like this is built into those lessons or as little supplements that I've made. And then we'll take you step by step. I have intro to jazz, intermediate jazz, advanced jazz, I have blue scale stuff, I have, you know, you, you, you know it, it, it's a lot and it's designed to help you get step by step without um, becoming overwhelmed. But I also love to help you on Skype or Zoom if you're interested. But whatever is right for you, that's what you do. But keep going, keep the musical flame alive. There's some links to click if you're interested, some other videos and some links below. And uh, thank you for joining me on this journey, and I'll see you tomorrow.